Well, welcome back to another episode of Continuum Meditations Discusses. I just wanted to give voice to my thoughts on the second episode of The Orville that aired tonight entitled Command Performance. And just to let you all know, there will be a few very minor spoilers in this particular review. I'm not conducting an in-depth analysis of the story. Just a few random thoughts on where the show went and what I took from it. You know, more and more this show is reminding me of The Next Generation, where I think it's getting a lot of its its cues from. Of course, it's taking cues from other series, the original series, Voyager, etc. But I see a lot of TNG in the Orville, and this is not just from the aesthetics, but the shape of the characters also. We see that Bordas is a nod to Worf, Isaac a hail to Data, Dr. Finn a salute to Counselor Troy, amongst others. And, you know, I, I think a lot of you can see this for yourselves. Anyway, tonight's episode, did, any, did, did this episode remind many of you of you TNG fans of the second season episode, The Arsenal of Freedom? where a very young Lieutenant Geordi LaForge was left in charge of the Enterprise by Captain Picard for the very first time in his career. You may recall in that episode that Geordi was faced with an unexpected crisis when an artificial intelligence weapon system on the planet Minos activated and began attacking the Enterprise in space and the away team on the surface. Picard was gone, Riker was gone, Data, Tasha Yar, Dr. Crusher, virtually the entire command staff. And besides Troy and Worf, Geordi was left on his own to lead the Enterprise through the danger with minimal support. He got into a minor conflict with the chief engineer of the day who tried to take command away from him, but Counselor Troy ultimately advised Geordi not to relinquish command and then went on to aid him in finding his confidence through the situation. Well, I don't know about you, but tonight I very much saw a young Jordi LaForge's story being repeated in the very green and inexperienced Alara Kitan, and I enjoyed it. Uh, it was not a verbatim repeat of the Arsenal of Freedom, you understand, but in many ways it did give a good allusion to it. And in Alara's case, she's left in command by Captain Mercer while he and, and Commander Grayson disembark on what they think is a standard rescue operation, only for the ship's two ranking officers to be kidnapped and, and taken to God knows where in the galaxy. Meanwhile, the third in command, Bordas, is effectively about to give birth and can't be disturbed for the next 21 days. This means that if the issue is going to be resolved, it's up to Alara by her lonesome self to get it done. With the help of her, the rest of her crew, of course. <laughs> so in comes Dr. Finn to if act effectively as a counselor and, and help Alara uh, you know, on her journey towards self-discovery and the discharge of her duty toward her ship and her fellow crewmates. This is very much like Geordi's own journey towards self-confidence in the arsenal of freedom. So I, I just really thought that this was a very interesting episode along those lines as it brought that memory back to me. Oh, uh, something else I wanted to bring up. There was something that caught my ear that I wanted to get you guys all thinking about. In the show, when Ed and Kelly are in the zoo, there was a reference made by one of the aliens to a species called the Mocklins. How many of you are familiar with the old radio science fiction serial from the 1950s called X-1? Do any of you remember that? That was an old show back in what some people called the golden age of, or the golden era of science fiction when radio dramas were still very popular, television was still kind of getting its footing in the average home. X-1 was such a drama. Uh, and it took a lot of its stories from that golden age or golden era of science fiction. One of the stories that it did was called If You Was a Mocklin by Murray Leinster. Uh, it aired in 1956. The word Mocklin jumped out at me because, as I said, If You Was a Mocklin was one of the titles of one of the stories. And I just thought to myself, with all of the allusions to the next generation, with all of the the Hail Marys that we keep getting from Seth MacFarlane, it made me wonder if he could be a bigger science fiction fan than just Star Trek by itself. Maybe someone who traces his sci-fi influence back to that golden era 
of, of what some consider to be classic science fiction from the likes of people uh, like Theodore Sturgeon, Horace Gold, L. Sprague de Camp, and others. Anyway, there was another reminder that came to me as I watched tonight. The Admiral who was talking to Alara, Admiral Tucker. I couldn't help but think of Admiral Hayden from The Next Generation as played by the late actor John Hancock. Any of you guys remember him? Some of you may remember Admiral Hayden as the Starfleet officer who communicated with Captain Picard over subspace about various tactical situations related to the Cardassians, the Romulans, and so forth. One of the episodes I recall him in chiefly was The Defector. You all remember The Defector, right? Third season episode where the Romulan Admiral uh, Al Aladar Jarok he defects to the Federation with this big idea of this top secret base that the Romulans are building. The Enterprise has to find it, destroy it, uh, in order to prevent the Romulans from invading Federation space, all that. Well, it was Admiral Hayden who advised Picard about what Starfleet wanted him to do in that particular situation. And we see that it's this Admiral Tucker who is advising Alara from Union headquarters on Earth. And I'm just thinking to myself again, uh, if we see this Admiral Tucker as a recurring character, will this be yet another nod to the next gen? Hmm? Just wondering. Just another thought to put in your minds, guys. So, Alara being in command tonight, though, she w that was very good in my opinion. It was obviously a breakout episode for her as a character to get some development. And you know what? It actually endeared her to me. I really enjoyed watching Alara overcome her fears and use her intelligence and her skills to gain more self-assurance and earn the respect of her crew. She, in my opinion, could very well be on the fast track to becoming a great character and perhaps even one of my favorite characters on the Orville, depending on where she goes from here. And you know what? While I'm at it, I probably should also say that uh, it really is the alien characters who are standing out the most to me so far in this series. I'm liking Bordas, and I'm really and especially liking Isaac, the android, who is an obvious uh, nod to Commander Data. But out of all of the human characters on the show, aside from the captain, I probably have to say that it's Dr. Finn who is jiving with me the most right now. Uh, oh, and by the way, I'm sure many of you uh, have figured this out, but for those of who, who haven't, Dr. Finn is played by the actress Penny Johnson-Gerald, who many, many of you may recognize as uh, Cassidy Yates from DS9, Deep Space Nine. Uh, she later went on to become become Cassidy Yates Sisko after she married Captain Benjamin Sisko from that series. Uh, you may also remember her as former First Lady Sherry Palmer from seasons one through three of the original 24 with Kiefer Sutherland. So, you know, if, uh, if any of you are just wondering and thinking to yourself, hey, I've seen that lady before, but I don't remember where, well, now you know where you may have seen her performances at least somewhere. Uh, let me at this point divulge a little bit here, though. Uh, I'm going to talk. Uh, I'm going to offer right now. Uh, I'm going to offer up a bit of a criticism of the Orville, one that I noted in the very first episode, but that I did not comment on in my first video, and that is the exceptional use of the tangy, colorful metaphors, if you will, to use a Spock phrase from Star Trek IV, the colorful metaphors that are being engineered into the program. Now. The Orville is obviously trying to be taken seriously as a science fiction show. It's not trying to tickle your funny bone at every turn. It's not trying to be a laugh a minute in every scene. It does want to be regarded as a serious effort at sci-fi entertainment. Now this is plain, it is obvious, it is evident. And one way that I think that it can do that, quite frankly, is to pull back on some of the more juvenile trash jokes that it's making use of and try for a more sophisticated way to engage in this form of banter, all right? Making fun of the human body, making fun of human body parts and human body functions is really easy to do. I mean, any person can do it. That's why juveniles do it in the locker rooms, right? But to do it in a way that, that doesn't demonstrate abject vulgarity or at least something akin to abject vulgarity is an art form that in my opinion, only the very best comedians are true masters of. One of the better comedians of the past 
who was capable of doing this was the late Benny Hill, in my opinion. And, and I know those of you who remember Benny Hill probably remember that he could get rather raunchy too, but he also managed to do that in a way that didn't leave you feeling as though you had been literally bashed over the head with jokes about breasts and penises and bowel movements every time he opened his mouth, okay? So that's something I'd like to see the Orville improve upon. And tonight's episode, by way of example, was an improvement in that regard. So having said that overall, uh, I am regarding the Orville with fondness though. I thought that Alara's presentation in tonight's episode really shined quality light onto her character. I thought that seeing Dr. Finn advise her to trust herself, to trust her skills, to trust her instincts, and to trust her people. These were all very reminiscent of Counselor Troy's advice to Jordy in The Arsenal of Freedom, and Alara's journey to that kind of faith in herself was very evocative of Jordy's own path toward the same in that episode of The Next Generation. So I think it was overall a very enjoyable episode. Now, lest you think I forget him, I have not. Bordas. Uh, giving birth tonight was quite a fascinating look at a monomorphic species reproductive process, or at least it was a part of it, anyway. Uh, I am definitely now curious how a member of such a species has given birth to a female, making the Bucklands now a dimorphic race from this point on, or at least this one time. Uh, and it does make me ask the question, has this ever happened before in Buckland history? And if so, how many times and why have these anomalies occurred? In other news, we are, at this point, one week away from the premiere of Star Trek Discovery, and in the interim, uh, in the interim, there has been a, a cascade of new details released on that. I won't go into all of it, but I will end this by saying that we shall see what we shall see on the 24th, just one week away, later on this week coming. So, until next time, Orville and Star Trek fans... <laughs>